Amen. Well, good evening, everybody. As you can tell, I'm wearing a t-shirt we haven't seen in probably over a year. Life on Mission. When I first came here to Ascension, we started with a sermon series based on bringing Jesus to our neighbors, to live a life to help share the gospel. Well, here we are a year later, and we're talking about Paul, the importance of a mission, to proclaim him. Now, how about all of you, when we talk about our mission, how needed Jesus is now? We look at the news, we hear what's going on outside, in Iraq, Turkey, France. We hear what's going on within our own nation. Even the hurt that's felt here in Wichita. We need to proclaim our Lord, who He is to those out there. Now, I don't know about you, though, but when I think about what's been going on, I have to ask, is this the best we can do as humans? All these wars, all this hate, this hurt that's going on, is this who we are? Now, the Bible has an answer to this, and the answer is no. We as humans, when we were created, Adam and Eve, God said we were very good. Things should have been wonderful. They should have been great. But something happened. What happened is that man fell. Sin entered the world. Now we hear that Sunday after Sunday, don't we, this idea that there's sin in the world, that man fell from grace and all these things, but how do we picture that? How can we think about it? Well, one way is this. When God made Adam and Eve, they were perfect. They were whole. But when sin entered the world, they were corrupted. We are corrupted. We have this hole that's missing right here inside of us. We have this need to fill it, to seek it, because there's something not right. Now, as a Christian, we know the answer to this. God's the one to put that piece together. That, God's the one to make us whole. But that's not the message the world tells us. Almost all the world religions base how they feel about this on two different solutions. Either you need to find a way to fix this, to find a way to put that piece back together yourself. And if you join us, we'll teach you the special ways to make yourself right. Or ignore it. Follow us. Learn how that doesn't truly exist and you will be in peace you will be happy. That's the message the world tells people. But we know better. So how do we proclaim it? How do we go outside those doors and share it? That's where our epistle reading comes into play. Now this comes from the book of Colossians. It's a letter to the Christian church in Colossae. So what's Colossae? Well, it's a Roman city. It's on the eastern side of the empire. It's a church that was not started by Paul, but part of this Christian movement that was happening. They're a city that's surrounded by Western and Eastern thought. There are religions all around the world that are at that location. And the Christian church doesn't know how to handle it. They're starting to mix things up. So Paul writes to them. So let's dig in together what Paul has to say to them, because guess what? We're in a similar situation. We are Christians, not started by Paul, getting a letter from him. We're in a society that tells people all different things that many a times are against our own mission about what God is doing. So let's dig in together in Colossians chapter 1. So in our reading, Paul starts off pretty quickly at the point of the problem. He says that we are all enemies of God. Now how is that? How are we enemies well, if we live our life thinking that we can fix ourselves, that we can plug in our heart the way it should be, then to hear that there's a God out there, a God that wants to fix us, doesn't sound good. In fact, we get defensive. You're going to tell me that God's in charge of my life. We become hostile. We become enemies, the idea that God would want to help us. But Paul doesn't stay there. He doesn't focus on the enemy part, but immediately lets us know how things are solved. See, we have all been reconciled to God because of Christ. He's letting know the people in Colossae 
that they are forgiven, that this whole idea that you're enemies, God took care of it. That hole in your heart that you're trying to figure things out, God mends it. That means for each of you, as you come here today, with all the hurts and things that are going on in your life, God does make it right. He does put you back together. And unfortunately for some people, they don't hear that all the time. In fact, if this is one of the first times you hear about what God does for you, know that after service, we are here to talk with you to share more about who this Christ is. But it doesn't just stop there, because there can be problems with that message. For the, for the Colossians, we read here that G, uh, Paul says, Christ's physical body. They were living in a culture that was telling them that this good news, that God's made things right, was something that was spiritual. That God didn't really come down to be with people. There's no way he'd be living, breathing. Instead, this old Jesus guy is somebody you should follow as a good teacher. Jesus is a good teacher. Does that sound familiar? Even today we have people challenging whether or not Jesus actually lived, breathed, died for us. But that's where we put our hope in. So if we believe in this, we believe that Jesus has died and reconciled us, what are we supposed to do? Well, Paul makes it pretty clear. We need to continue in our faith. Do not move from the hope of the gospel. If you say that you actually believe in Jesus, that you are actually forgiven, then you need to grow and learn more about who this Jesus is. It's not just saved just to say, good, I'm saved, goodbye. You need to spend time in the Word. That's where our gospel reading comes into play, because we read about a person named Mary. When Jesus came to have dinner with this group, she sat at his feet. She knew who he was, and she listened to him. She continued, she held on to that hope of what he brought. In the same time, we live in a culture that tries to mix that up, confuse that. We need to hold on to what Paul is telling us about, about this Jesus, like Mary who was at his feet. Now, as we go and proclaim and share our message to those who are outside, it's important to tell them about ourselves, where we are at. Paul takes time to tell the members at Colossae that he's suffering. In fact, he's in prison at the time he's writing this, that he's struggling. And that the only way to truly bring your message out to people out there is allow yourself to share your struggles. To let them know that things aren't hunky-dory all the time. Because we're not talking about some help, self-help book. We're not talking about something that will make your life amazing. What we're talking about here is about a God who made things right. Paul continues on and talks about, very key word here, became a servant of the gospel. Paul calls himself a deacon here. A deacon is somebody who serves a church. Now, it's very easy when we think about this, and we want to tell people about Jesus, that we want to be in charge of things, that we want to have authority, make decisions, make rules. But that's not a servant. A servant who is somebody who puts himself underneath somebody to put somebody before them so that they can hear the word. Here at Ascension, we can easily get this mixed up, especially with how large we are. All the commissions, committees, and things that we have. It's easy to get focused on how we can be doing things for Jesus, making decisions for all kinds of church planning events, and forget the importance of serving. But what are we serving? It's the gospel. And what is it? Paul tells the Colossians it's a mystery. See, one of the scary things to think about is this Bible, this book, an encyclopedia of 66 books. All that writing in it focuses on one person and one event. The redemption, the rec being reconciled through Jesus. Everything goes through him. And because he's there, we can read it. We can understand these weird things that we read about through Christ. Our Old Testament reading tonight was a story of how God came to be with Abraham. Three persons. Nobody truly understands what happens here. We don't know who these people are, but it's the Lord. 
People could easily say, how could God be with people? We have an answer to that. We're Christians. Because Christ was with us. He dwelt with us. He lived. And because we know he can do that, we can look back at a mystery like this and know that God can do these things. He can be with his people. And this other point that Paul makes, to be made known for the Gentiles. This message that we need to share with people is meant for everyone. Everyone is supposed to proclaim it, to tell it, to teach it. When Paul writes here, says we proclaim, he's talking about himself, he's talking about the elders, he's talking about the church. As a church, we have a task, and that is to tell people who Jesus is. And why is that important? Because that message is what makes people fully mature in Christ. That fully mature, it means to be fully developed, to mean perfect. Because what Christ has done, the whole living, dying, and rising again, we are made perfect. That peace that's missing in our lives, we're made whole. Now to go and share people and talk with people about Jesus is a scary thing. Especially if they're your friends or your family. Because they can start judging. Paul ends our reading here making a very important point. That he, what he writes, what he tells them, is the power of Christ within him. It's not about running or doing some special things, get yourself psyched up to tell people about Jesus. It's having that faith, that trust, you know what? Jesus is in you. And what you need to say will, be, will come out because of him. Now, in order to do that, to go and proclaim him, I have take-home cards for you. And I have three devotionals for you to look through to help us prepare ourselves for this mission. The first one is to remembering the great commandment. Pastor Girdle touched on this last week. Deuteronomy chapter, uh, chapter 6. There's two parts to it. Love your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all, all your mind. Your first love should be always God. But is it? This can be a struggle for us. If we go back to our gospel reading with these two sisters, we found out one of the sisters forgot this. When Jesus came with the family, she was so excited. Martha made sure everything was taken care of. She made herself busy. Don't we like to make ourselves busy? We get so busy, we get distracted that God is with us. And so when she asks God, hey, call out my sister, I'm working here. What does Jesus say? You are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed. Indeed, only one. Jesus reminds her what the great commandment is. Your first step needs to be God. Your first step needs to be at his feet. If you actually want to reach people and share who Jesus is in your life, you first have to remember this. You first have to be at the feet of God. To be time in scripture, to be with him. Because if you're not, there's no way you're going to tell people about who he is. So once we spend that time, once we remember the commandment, then it's important then to live out the great commission. Matthew 28. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commandment. The second part of the greatest, of the greatest commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. If you take the time to learn to grow in faith for yourself, then to love your neighbor is to go out there and share who Jesus is, how God makes things right. And as I said earlier, for most of us, that's a very scary task to go share with other people. So I leave you with some words of encouragement from Isaiah. Isaiah, who's writing at a time that things are very messed up for God's people. Assyria is coming in. People are about to be killed, slaughtered. The king doesn't know what he's doing at the moment. People are freaking out. But Isaiah writes this. You who bring good news to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up and do not be afraid. 
Isaiah is encouraging God's people to go share who he is. If you take time with this, with this devotion, at the very end it makes a point how this is made for all nations. God is with you. As you leave this week, as you take time through these devotions, I encourage you to be in prayer. I, impur- I encourage you to say this when you get done with your readings. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Because the only way to go out there and to proclaim Jesus is to know that what he's done for you. Amen?